Hey everyone, welcome back to another video. To kick things off, I'd like you to take a second and see if you can evaluate this integral for me here, the integral of x dx. Well, it's not a trick question, it's as simple as it looks. The answer is going to be, well, x squared over 2 plus c, a very simple inverse power rule there. Now, you may have asked yourself at some point as we've gone through this, the different kinds of integration techniques, is there a way we can actually solve for this plus c? How could we go ahead and how can we actually find a way to solve for that plus c? Because in all the integration stuff we've done so far, be it the basic integration, u substitution, or integration by parts, we've always had that plus c there in every indefinite integral that we've done. So how could we actually solve for that? Well, that's going to be the object of this video, and we're going to start with a brief sort of visualization to help us understand uh, how we might go about doing this. All right, so let's look at this visualization here. So I've plotted in red our antiderivative, or our, in, our definite integral, x squared over 2 plus c. Right? That's the, the derivative of this will give us x. And that's also what I've plotted just down here, uh, the derivative of x squared over 2 plus c. And you can kind of see that gives us the line y equals x. Right? But also notice that regardless of what value I choose of c that I choose on this slider here, only the red curve is moving. The black line is not affected. In other words, no matter what value of c I choose, this function x squared over 2 plus c will still satisfy the condition that the derivative is going to equal y equals x. Right? That's always going to be true regardless of the value of c that I pick. So in other words, I need another constraint or another sort of parameter to help me narrow it down to one value of c. Because currently any value of c is good for, the, for this particular condition. So I need an additional sort of uh, restriction. And so to remedy this, we can have an additional constraint. Specifically, I'm going to say, all right, I want this antiderivative to go through the point 2 comma 4. And the fact that it's 2 comma 4 doesn't matter. I can make it, I can make 2 comma 4 any particular particular point on the xy plane. But I'm saying I want this curve, my antiderivative, to go through that point. And so by saying that, now suddenly you'll notice that I've narrowed it down to only one specific value of c. Because again, most other every almost every other value of c is not going to pass through that, will make this curve not pass through that point, right? For example, if c is 6.8, now the curve is way up there. If, the curve, if I pick c to be negative 8, it's way down here. So the only value of c that will make this curve go through that point is, as it turns out, c is equal to 2. So if I choose c equal to, is equal to 2, this curve will go through that point. And if not, it won't. So by choosing, by forcing this curve to go through one specific point, I can narrow this down from infinitely many values of c that will work to just one value of c. And I can do this for any point I want. I can move this point all the way over here, and I can choose another value of c that will maybe, no, maybe not over there, but maybe like over here. I can choose any value of c. I can choose another value of c that will make that work. I think c equals 0 will make that work. I can also maybe put this down here, and we'll find another value of c that makes that work. Maybe down here. Now for points out there, unfortunately, my window is not large enough, but we can pick any point, and then there will be exactly one value of c that will make this curve go through that. And that's a really powerful idea, and that's what we call the idea of an initial condition. All right, let's bring this all together. So the whole point of what we've just done is that we're setting up an additional constraint to our problems to allow us to solve for a single value of c, right? So we're setting up this additional constraint, which is a point, right? A point that my antiderivative must pass through, right? And this is called an initial condition. You'll see this word used a lot if you decide to go into differential equations, because we use initial conditions a lot there. But the idea is, if our function goes to, if we are uh, restricting our function to go through one specific point, that eliminates that extra plus c, right? Because we now no longer have infinitely many constants that would work. We now just limit it down to just one. That's the whole point of initial conditions. So to wrap up this video, we're just going to do a couple of examples so you can see the algebra behind how we solve initial initial condition problems. It's not very hard, but I just want to show you that. And then we'll call it a day after this. All right, first example here. So this is we're finding the integral of x dx, but again, we're ha we have this added constraint 
that y of 2 is equal to 4, assuming y, of course, is our antiderivative. This actually is exactly the same thing that we did in the graph earlier. So this is just showing us, showing, showing us the algebra behind how we arrive at that solution, right? So let's go ahead and do this. So the first thing we have to do, of course, is just integrate. Right? So we're just going to go ahead and integrate to find that antiderivative or definite integral, if you will, indefinite integral, if you will. So to do this, again, that's, uh, that's just going to come out to x squared over 2 plus c. Right? We've, we already talked about that, not a very challenging integral. The second step we're going to do is we're going to head and invoke our initial condition. We're going to go ahead and invoke that initial condition up here to help us solve for c. Right? So we know that y of 2 is equal to 4. Right? So over here, we're going to have 4 equals, or of course, assuming this thing is y. So 4 is equal to 2 squared over 2 plus c, right? 2 squared, of course, is 4. 4 over 2 is just 2. So we're going to get that this is equal to 2 plus c. Subtract 2 from both sides, we end up with c is equal to 2, right? So what does this mean? So our final answer, right? We'll actually write this out this time. Our final answer is that y, or this uh, this antiderivative here, is equal to um, is x squared over 2, not plus c, but plus 2, right? This is equal to y equals x squared over 2 plus 2. Now, what does this satisfy? Well, this satisfies a couple of things. So firstly, it satisfies the condition that y prime has to equal x. That is still true. That's the whole point of integration, right? The derivative of this will still equal what we have inside the integral, which is x. But it also satisfies another thing. It, that satisfies our initial condition here, which is that y of 2 has to equal 4. And if you plug in 2, you can verify that yourself. So that's basically, how, by basically the whole point of what we're doing here. Uh, we'll do one final example, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. All right, so final example. Um, this is not too much more difficult. The integration is just maybe a tiny bit more challenging, but you know, nothing, nothing too, too terrible. So let's go ahead and get this start, get this done. So the first thing we're going to do is integrate. Yeah. So if we uh, do this, it's going to be a very simple u substitution. So we can say, all right, um, u is equal to 4x. So we get du is equal to uh, 4 dx and dx is equal to du over 4. Um, so when we plug this all in, we can factor out, we can take this 5 and this 1 fourth and factor them out. So we get 5 fourths times the integral of, well, we have sine of u du, right? That's a very nice uh, integral that's just going to be negative cosine, right? So we have negative 5 fourths cosine of u plus c and if we and it's important that we actually plug back in for x before we invoke our initial condition so we're going to plug back in for x and so we're going to get negative 5 fourths cosine of 4x plus c and that right there is our antiderivative but we're not done yet right because we also need to go ahead and invoke our initial condition right so once again we know that y of pi over 2 must equal 2 so we have 2 is going to equal to going to be equal to negative 5 fourths cosine of well 4 pi times pi over 2 is just going to be well we, let's actually write that out so 4 times pi over 2 plus c well, 4 times pi over 2 is just 2 pi, right? And cosine of 2 pi, very nicely, is just going to be 1. So we have 2 is equal to negative 5 fourths times 1, which is just, you know, which is 1, plus c. And if we add negative 5 fourths to both sides, keeping in mind that 2 is the same thing as 8 fourths, then we get c is equal to 13 over 4. But our final answer, right, our final answer is going to be y equals 
uh, negative 5 fourths cosine of 4x plus 13 over 4. And this right here is an equation that does two things. Like we talked about, firstly, it satisfies the condition that y prime is going to equal to 5 sine of 4x. Right? The derivative of this is going to come out to 5 sine of 4x. And secondly, it passes through the point pi over 2, comma 2. So two conditions are satisfied with this equation here. So this right here is our final answer. So I hope you found this helpful. Thank you again for watching, and uh, I'll see you in the next video. Take care.